Good morning and welcome to Warehouse Church. My name's Jerrica and we're so happy to see you here this morning. If it's your first time, please text the word welcome to the number on the screen to allow us to further connect with you. In a moment, the worship team is going to lead us in a few songs and then our guest speaker, Nathan Thomas, is going to lead us in our message. You can follow along by downloading the free YouVersion Bible app and finding us under the events tab. You can also do this by scanning the QR code located on the back of the chair in front of you. We pray you enjoy the service and have a wonderful Sunday. Let's stand and worship church. last week when we talked about Jonah, this song reminds me of that, that we just should be sent by the Lord, that the Lord can use any of us. It doesn't matter who you are, what your past was, where you're headed, you can help the people along your road, bring them with you into the glory and peace that is our Lord. Let's sing.
Church, this morning, let's just sit in that. Let's just sit in the thought that even at your darkest moments, the Lord can still use you. We can lay down what we have, if it's a lot or a little bit. Lay down everything, all our worries, our doubts, our depression, our anxieties, and He can still turn it into something beautiful. But the key is you have to lay yourself down first. And I know so many of us struggle with that. So this morning as we sing this next song, I just pray over us right now that we can, we can lay ourselves down and just open ourselves to how the Lord might use us.
come to you this morning. I just let that be our prayer, Lord. Let us open ourselves up, Lord, and lay down what might be holding us back. Lord, anything, Lord, that has us chained to the ground so we can't move for you, Lord, help us release it. Unlock those chains so we can move forward and do your work. Lord, send us. That's why we're here. Lord, I just pray over the rest of this service that you just flow throughout this room, Lord. You flow throughout Nathan as he comes to bring the word, Lord. Just open him up to give your word, Lord, and speak through him. Lord, it's in your wonderful name we pray this morning. the whole time. Wow. God is good. Okay. <laughs> I heard y'all singing a lot louder than that. God is good. Amen. You better believe that. Listen, you may not realize it and you may not understand it, but God's already in this service. God has already worshiped and set everything up in an appropriate way. And basically the song service has already preached most of my message. I know some of you guys are pretty excited you're getting out of here early, right? <laughs> hey, listen, he already told me that I could preach as long as I want. He did. He said, y'all are leaving at 12, but I can preach as long as I want to. <laughs> uh, so I, I've already got the go-ahead on that. My name's Nathan Thomas. Uh, I live here in uh, the area. I live in Prestonsburg. Um, my wife, Selena, a lot of y'all know her. She is a rock star. She uh, works for the city of Prestonsburg. She's a firefighter, paramedic. Um, she will be where you need her in your worst time. <laughs> that's usually where you'll find her, and that's where she finds me most of the time is in my worst time. But um, we're tickled death to be here. Seth called, and he uh, texted me, actually. Nobody calls anybody anymore, do they? <laughs> so he, he texted me. He said, hey, would you be interested to do this? I'm like, brother, I'd love to do that. Be honored. And so we got a couple dates set up. Uh, if you like what you hear today, I'll be back on the 11th of February. If you don't like what you hear, I'm still coming. So uh, just know that I will show up on the 11th of February. Looking forward to worshiping with you guys. Please turn with me in your Bibles this morning. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. There was a sales manager, and he was trying to motivate his sales force. And he got them together, and he got a large whiteboard. You guys have seen those big whiteboards, right? And what he did was he put a small black dot in the middle of that board. He asked everyone what they saw. He went around the room, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? Each person said, I, I see the black dot. Oh, they were impressed, you know, a little bitty black dot. They were focused. I see a dot. I see a dot. I see a dot. And then he said, isn't it interesting that every one of you said that you saw a dot, but none of you mentioned the large white area. It's evident that many of us go through life looking at that tiny little dot of self-concern. We're focused on ourselves. We look at what we've got going on in our lives, and we see our problem, and we see the difficulties that we're enduring. But Jesus said, lift up your eyes, for the fields are white with harvest. This morning, I want you to understand that the fields are white with harvest. This morning, there are a great number of people right where you live, right down the street, maybe your next door neighbor, who don't go to church, who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. This morning, I want to let you know that all believers have been called to be an evangelist. Now, some of us think, well, I'm not going to be a preacher. I'm not going to be, I didn't say we're going to be a preacher. To be an evangelist means that you simply are willing to evangelize and tell people about Jesus Christ and about what he's done for you. Shame on us if we're not willing to tell people about the greatest thing that's ever happened to us in our entire life. That should get a big amen right there because... We need to look at ourselves, and we need to take an inward look this morning. Are you an evangelist for Jesus Christ, or are you keeping the greatest secret as a, I mean, greatest gift as a secret this morning? We need to know the fields are white with harvest. We want to believe many times that this is for somebody else. 
I, I will pray for them. Or, or the preacher should do something. Now listen, this morning, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but i got to tell you the truth. And, and if, if I do hurt your feelings, if you'll come up to me after the service and let me know that I hurt your feelings, if you'll apologize, I'm willing to forgive you right away. So just know that if you're insulted, please come and apologize to me and I'll forgive you. That's funny, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. No matter, <laughs> I already got somebody talking about it. You can talk as much as you want during my service. Just don't take it away from me, okay? Let me do most of the preaching. That's, that's good with me. I like amens. I like communication. Can we do an amen? Do you guys do amens here? Amen. Jesus Christ is risen. Amen. He's coming again. Amen. And he's coming for me. Amen. Praise God. All right. Well, no matter how faithful you attend... No matter how much you give, no matter how upright you live, no matter how faithfully that you serve, and no matter how beautifully you sing, which you guys are amazing, your song service is spectacular, but no matter how often you sing, if you are not putting forth a diligent effort to bring people to Christ, you are not and you cannot be right with God got one that's right let me tell you something let me repeat that if you are not diligently and faithfully bringing people to Christ you cannot be right with God now I'm not here to judge you and I'm not talking about whether or not you're a Christian but you cannot say that you're right with God did that hurt your feelings pay attention we are not talking about your success rate a lot of times people want to check how many people that they've been successfully able to witness to. And we struggle with that. We look at the number. We look at the statistics. I told 30 people about Christ and nobody came to believe. I told this many. Nobody showed up. I'm not talking about your success rate. What I'm talking about is your faithfulness and your diligent efforts to serve God. How can I say that you are not right? Well, because you are committing high treason against your king. Jesus commanded and not suggested that uh, he didn't even imply it, but he commanded us, go and make disciples. <coughs> he didn't say some of you. He didn't say most of you. He said simply go. And if you go to the Hebrew context, what that literally means is all of you. If you are a believer and accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are commanded to go and to make disciples. All believers I tell you, all believers have been called to be an evangelist. This morning, if you'll listen closely, I think you'll understand that one day every person in this room will pass on and you will be held accountable. There was a pastor who told a story of a man on his deathbed. He spoke and he was weeping to his pastor, just crying his eyes out. He was on his deathbed. He said, Pastor, I know I'm going to pass away and I want you to know that I'm not afraid. I hope you can say that this morning. He said, I know I'm not afraid. I'm certain that I have been saved. And I have no doubt or question where my eternal home lies. I'm not afraid to die. I am ashamed to die. I am ashamed to face the Father. As I have not been a soul winner. I am respected. I am a respected member. And I have served faithfully in many aspects of my church. I've helped lead the music. I've participated in many Sunday school classes. I've attended church regularly, but I have not been a soul winner for the Lord. And now I go to meet him empty-handed. If you were to die today, how would you meet the Savior? Would you come empty-handed, or would you become bringing in the sheaves? Some of you didn't know what the sheaves were. The sheaves are the harvest to which you were be held accountable. You've heard that song, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, but you must be bringing in the sheaves. I believe that when we all pass away, and, and, and I don't know to what extent, but I, you know, the Bible says there's no tears in heaven, there's no sadness, there's no anything like that. But on the day when we reach Christ and we're allowed to lay the crowns at his feet, There'll be many saddened as they bring one crown or two to lay at his feet. Fortunately today, regardless of where we are in the service, everybody here is still alive. Can't see everybody, but it looks like everybody's still alive. So we still have the opportunity to win more for Christ today. We still have the opportunity to leave this service today and go and tell someone about Jesus Christ. Remember, I'm not asking you to 
convert somebody. A lot of times Christians get all tore up because I tell them and tell them and tell them and they don't accept Christ. But it's not our responsibility for the conversion. It's our responsibility to plant the seed. Bringing in the sheaves, and we must do that so that we can be rejoicing. Do you want to be the one who gave his all, or do you want to be the one who shows up empty-handed? Our scripture today is about a man named Philip. Philip was doing an amazing thing. He had gone out, and he was serving the Lord, and he was in a revival. There were people being saved and doing great things. He was a deacon. He was leading so many revivals that the number to be saved was too countless to do. But Philip understood that he was called to be an evangelist. An evangelist is not a preacher, but it's someone who is a reacher. Let's change your whole mindset about that. Evangelists are not preachers. Evangelists are reachers. And we all need to be reachers. And we see here that an angel came and he talks to Philip and he says, Hey, Phil, look, I know things aren't going great here, but I want you to go to Gaza. Now, if you don't know where Gaza is, Gaza is basically a desert. <laughs> He's like, look, I know everything's fantastic. I know that you're doing well, you're successful, but I need you to go to Gaza. Wow. How many of us be willing to go to Gaza? Let's read. If you don't mind, I want you to stand with me as we read God's word just to honor him. Uh, I believe he's deser de deserving of it. So let's all stand together as we read. Just going to read about 78 verses. Just kidding. <laughs> just making sure you're in I can't see you, so I hope you're still awake. I got to check every now and again. All right. We're reading out of the NIV here this morning, and it's starting in there in verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki. This is uh, basically the queen of the Ethiopians, so he was in charge of all of the funds there. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Isaiah, just so you know, one of the most amazing books of the Old Testament. Um, it, it's spectacular. I hope, I hope you've read it many times. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Philip did that. He says immediately, Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who could speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Let's pray. God, this morning, like more than I've ever felt in so many times. God, you are in this service. Every song talked about our willingness to go and our willingness to surrender, God, and be willing to be used by you. I know that you are in this church this morning, Father, and thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for worshiping here with us. Thank you for your presence. God, I'm an inadequate speaker. You know that, and I thank you for using this inadequate speaker so many times to speak through me, God. Let no one see me, no, no one hear my words, but may, be the, may they be your words, Father God. And just let it be an outspoken outcry that people will respond, people will see their need to be reachers for you, Father, and be a true evangelist. God, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, stand back up. Just kidding. Just stay seated. <laughs> so we can see here how God wants to use him but we also see here how God wants to use you. Understand this important fact this morning. God never leaves a fully surrendered and cleansed vessel unused. See, we're, we're still working on the amens here. I'm not real sure, but um, God never leaves, and that's the key, a fully surrendered and cleansed vessel unused. We need to understand that we have a responsibility first in our own lives. We need to be cleansed and we need to be uh, surrendered fully. Would you like to be used by the Lord? Amen. That's a little bit better. I, I like where that's going. I want to give you another shot. Some of y'all missed that. Would you like to be used by the Lord this week? Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. Fantastic. 
Would you like to be a witness? Would you like to meet the Lord, bringing in the sheaves to him? And would you like to live in this world filled with joy and also in the world to come filled with joy? And I think the answer is a resounding yes and amen. So I'm going to give you some things that we need to do and how you can do that. So if you're taking notes, we're going to throw them up here. The first thing we need to do is we need to be sensitive to the direction of the Spirit. You must be sensitive to the direction of the spirits. God's ways are often unexplained. A lot of us want to know why, God, why? Give me an answer. Give me a why. If you know what the word why means, it simply means this. I need your understanding and give me your information so I can help you make a better decision. Our kids ask us all the time, why? Why? Why, Papa? My, my granddaughter, why? Why? Why, why is the moon white? Why is the, and you know, I'm pretty smart, so I just make stuff up. So, but, you know, why? And, and, and you got to go to bed. Why? You, you got to eat your vegetables. Why? You need to do this at work. Why? And our why is simply, hey, look, you may not have the right answer. Why don't you go ahead and tell me what you're thinking and why you think I should do this, and then I'll evaluate that and make sure it's right. So when God asks us to do something and you say why, you have the gall to ask God, hey, I'm not sure if you got all this right. Why don't you think about it a little bit and you work it off of me and we'll see if I can come up with a better solution. You would never say that to God Almighty. Verse 26 and 27, it says, he didn't tell Philip any of the details. He simply told him, go. No more explanation, no more details, no more answer, go. And guess what Philip did? He went. God's ways are often unexplained, but they're often unforeseen. You know, we want to know what the end of the story is. We want to get to the end, and we want to see all the details of the end, and we want to know why it's happening and why things are going the way they're going, and we want to know what's the end of the result and the end answer because that helps us along the way if we know the answer. Well, let me tell you, I got a real good explanation. This will make it real simple. The battle's over. Jesus won. And we are part of the victory team. You don't need to know anything else. So when God says go, and when God commands you to do it, go with faith knowing that he's already won. And more than that, he's already gone before you. Who knows who the next individual individual is that God may have for you to lead to him? It may be the cashier at Food City. It may be your waitress at the restaurant you go to today. Or waiter. It may be one of your children. It may be your next door neighbor. We don't know. Ephesians 3.20 in the New Living Translation says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish... Can't read my writing. (laughs) Infinitely more than we might ask or think. Don't laugh. It's hard to see up here. (laughs) Through God, we can accomplish infinitely more than we think we can on ourselves. Listen, in my prayer, you heard me say I'm an inadequate speaker. And, and, And some of you who may know me, you're like, no, you never shut up. No, I'm not talking about my ability to talk. I'm talking about my ability to be worthy to share God's word. And I know that I'm not. I know that in of myself... This, this simple message is probably too complicated for even my simple mind. But through God, it's infinitely more able to reach you in ways that I don't even know you need to be reached. Listen, there's people this here that this morning, young people, old people, regardless of your age, God's calling you right now to be a servant for him. God's calling you right now to be more active in this church. You guys are without a pastor right now, and there's a huge burden of excuse that Satan will use and say, well, you don't need to do it right now. You guys don't have a leader. You don't need to do it right now. There, there's no reason. We're, we don't know what our direction. We don't have an a, a area that we're going. But let me tell you something. Now is the amazing, perfect time to be used by God right now. Right now is when God... Could you imagine if people across Eastern Kentucky said, I don't know what's happening over there at Warehouse Church. They don't even have a pastor, and they are on fire for the Lord, and people are getting saved, and lives are being changed. It must be God. That's exactly, I like that, whoa. Now, (laughs) I don't know if you use that a lot, but you go right ahead. Whoa, it's okay with me. But could you imagine all of Eastern Kentucky saying, 
What's going on? Warehouse Church is on fire. They're, they're, they're having to build out in the part Seth just showed me. They got to knock out the back wall and knock it open because they can't fit everybody in their building. And they don't even have a pastor right now. God must be leading that church. Wow, that would be awesome. Let me tell you a story. On April 1st, 1885, some of you smarty Alex, I was not there. A Sunday school teacher named Mr. Kimball laid a trembling hand on the shoulder of a 19-year-old shoe salesman. At the age of four, this salesman was orphaned. He was brought up hard and never received an education. And this teacher spoke with this salesman, and he explained the gospel to this shoe salesman. And that shoe salesman accepted Christ. That shoe salesman's name was Dwight L. Moody. If you've heard of the Moody Bible Institute, he was the founder and father of that and who was named after. D.L. began to share the gospel and began with inner cities and Sunday schools. One day, Moody went to hear a man named Henry Varley. Brother Varley said, The world has not yet to see what the Lord can do with a man who is totally surrendered to him. Moody said, I will be that man. Moody was uneducated, but he knew God could use him. The last letter he wrote had 38 grammatical errors in it. I could definitely beat that because mine would have about 70. He traveled overseas and preached in a man's church named F.B. Meyer. He went overseas and preached at uh, Brother Meyer's church. Meyer was a very cultured Brit. If you've ever met the Brits... Very cultured people. And he was very proper in all that he did. Moody preached with his all, and he told some stories, but he didn't use the proper English. The king's English wasn't spoken properly there. He told many tearjerkers, such as the story of a man who knew he was going to die, and before he died, he led everyone in his Sunday school class to the Lord. This story brought many tears to the eyes of the congregation, but Meyer was mortified. As he heard the grammatically inept man speak, he could not believe he'd allowed this person to come and speak in his church. He said to himself, when will this man finish and what have I done? How did I ever let him come into my pulpit? Later the next week, he was having tea and crumpets probably (laughs) with a young lady or an old, I'm sorry, an older lady of his congregation. He asked her, how are things going with you, madam? To which she replied, wonderful, Brother Meyer. I was so moved and inspired by the message of Brother Moody that I went out and led all the ladies of my women's group to the Lord. F.P. Meyer testified, I learned from Moody that day the language of the soul and my life was changed forever. Later, F.P. Meyer came to America. He was preaching at a Bible college about a total surrender and that we must be totally surrendered to God. In the audience was a man named Wilbur Chapman that was considering dropping out of school. He was not willing to pay the price to serve. Not knowing each other, Meyer made this statement in his sermon. If you are here today and you are not willing to be used by God, God will use you right where you are as the starting point. I'm going to stop there in this story and understand this. Maybe you don't feel like you have anything to give. Maybe you don't feel adequate. Maybe you don't feel like that you're ready to fully commit to what God has for you. Let me tell you something. God can use you right where you are as the beginning of where you need to be. Right where you are with the tools and the understanding and and your biblical resources and knowledge of what you have, that could be the starting point. And if you'll let God use you and you'll totally surrender to him, he can use you right now right where you are. Chapman said, that's me. Make me willing and I will serve. And Chapman became a great evangelist and he was used by the Lord. Near the end of Chapman's ministry, he sought out a friend that was a professional baseball player. His name was W.A. Sunday. Today, many of you may have known him as Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday, uh, was was an excellent baseball player, and, and he, he talked to him and shared the ministry with him and, and told him about Jesus Christ. And Sunday uh, was so moved 
that he asked him, will you help me with this ministry? Chapman says, please, I need your help. And Sunday would, would it come every week. He said, I'll do it. He helped put up the tents. And he put out the chairs, and he drove the stakes for the tent. And every so often, when he needed to, he would even preach the message. Chapman said, take this ministry and let God use you. So Sunday took it all. He even took Chapman's sermon, sermon notes to preach from. He said, okay, I'm going to use it. I'm going to do what you want me to. And he used Chapman's notes, and he began to preach. Sunday began to hold huge revivals. And it was said that he led over a million people to Christ. One week, Billy Sunday went to church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a group of men were inspired to begin to pray for Charlotte and to pray for the world. Are you praying for Prestonsburg right now? Are you praying for Eastern Kentucky? Are you praying for your community? Are you praying for the United States? You ought to be. These men were so on fire that they began to pray for Charlotte and prayed for the world. And they began to pray, Lord, send someone to turn Charlotte upside down and shake the world. Send us another man to lead a revival week after week after week. In 1934, the Lord sent Mordecai Ham to Charlotte to hold a revival. And in that revival, a 16-year-old lanky little farm boy decided to go to that revival. And he said, I'm going to go because I bet there will be a lot of pretty girls there. Some of you might be here for that very reason. He said, you know, uh, if, if I'm going to go, he became concerned. And he said, the preacher probably won't call on me or notice me if, if I sit behind him. So he sat up in the, in the choir loft. He was hoping not to be noticed. And he sat behind the preacher. So William sat behind the preacher, and, and he sat there where the Lord found him. That day, William gave his heart to the Lord. And we know that William Graham, named Billy, has been used by the Lord to this day in such a mighty way that has become almost legendary. But this was all because of an unbroken chain from one man who led a 19-year-old, uneducated shoe salesman to the Lord. You don't know what God can do if you will just let him. That 19-year-old shoe salesman may be in your path this week to which Billy Graham may come out of because of your willingness to be used as an evangelist. We must be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Secondly, we must be swift for the demands of the Holy Spirit. Now, don't worry, I only have nine more points, okay? It's going to go fast. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it, and he immediately did. First, we need to understand that God's ways require action. They require action. So many of us want to just sit on the sidelines. We want to cheer from the balcony if you get right with God, you'll have to backslide to keep from winning souls. If you get your life in such a way that you're studying faithfully and you're serving God diligently, you're going to have to backslide to keep from winning people to Christ. It's just that simple. Philip, go. And guess what? Philip didn't just go. Philip ran. <laughs> I love that. It says, then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading the Isaiah the prophet, and when the Holy Spirit calls on you or leads you, you better run. <laughs> God, I need you, or God says, I need you to do this. And, and, and we're like, ah, you know, I got this thing going this week. I got a golf game on Sunday. You really, I got to work things out. Uh, my kids have softball practice. Uh, I got this going. I can't, God, I'll fit you in if I can. No, we better go and we better run. We miss a lot of golden opportunities because we are not swift to react. Sometimes there's that nagging thing that you get and that feeling that you get and you know you need to do something about it and you just keep pushing it away and pushing it away until the opportunity's gone. There was a barrel of fish and on the side of the barrel it read, if not delivered in three days, never mind. Some of y'all are getting this good. Barrel of fish. Not delivered three. Never mind. Okay. All right. 
If you're not studying God's word and preparing yourself, you are an unclean vessel, and God can't use you. God cannot use a dirty vessel. God can't use a vessel that's it's got sin in its life and it's continuously falling every single day with the same thing and not asking for repentance. We don't want people to know there's problems in our life. We don't want people to know we're struggling with something inside. We don't want people to know that we've got difficulties. So when the altar call comes, we sit in our chair, we stay back there because, oh, I don't want them talking about me. Isn't this live video? Don't people know what I'm doing up there? Let me tell you something. If you're not willing to come to the altar in front of a bunch of Christians and people that love you and care about you, I guarantee you're going to struggle out in the world where people despise you. And say all manners of evil against you, as the scripture tells us. This is a place of safety. This is a place of protection. And this altar in and of itself is probably man-made. It's pretty sturdy. Uh, but it doesn't have any value in and of itself. The reason you come forward is so that you can tell Satan in his court of attack, I have 35 to 50, 75, how many? Is, I cannot see how many is out there. I've got all these witnesses, Satan, that saw me commit my heart to the Lord. And recommit my heart to the Lord and tell God that I'm going to serve him. So get thee behind me, Satan. You've lost this battle. God's ways require action, but God's ways require uh, us to be prepared. Look at verse 34 and 35 when he asks him what he should do. And he asks him about the scripture. He says, What's, how am I supposed to know? And Philip begins, it says in the verse 35, to explain to him about Jesus. This, this is a daunting thing that's factual. But so many of your friends uh, have asked, well, can you tell me about this? And you have to say, I don't know. Go ask the preacher. <laughs> Go ask one of our deacons. Let me get this guy on speed dial. I don't know. And you know why you don't know is because you're not prepared. I don't want you to raise your hands because I don't want you to embarrass yourself. But have you committed this year to faithfully be doing a devotional Bible study with God? Are you getting up every day and at some point in your day reading God's word and faithfully studying God's word and asking God to reveal his hidden truths to you so that when that person says, how am I supposed to know what this means? You can tell them about Jesus. Are you doing that? Many times we think it's, it's our job is, is to uh, make the seed grow. All our responsibility is to do is to plant. Uh, it, it would be ridiculous. Could you imagine if a farmer planted his seeds and then he sat out in, on his porch and yelled at the seeds till they started growing? Come on, grow! <laughs> get up, get up, get up! No, he plants them and then he trusts the Lord. Some of us are planting beans and hoping corn shows up. It's, it's that ridiculous. We are only supposed to plant, but guess what? We must plant. <laughs> we must plant. We must be willing to be used by God to plant the seed. Some of you here this morning are not willing to plant because it takes too much work. It's too hard. It's too hard. It's too much I know there's a lot of people sitting on the sidelines going, well, I'll give money to it. <laughs> How much do you need? Where are you going? Africa? I got you. Florida? I'll take care of it. You want to go help the flood victims? Let me know. How much? I'll write the check. You want to tell somebody about Jesus Christ way over there? Just let me know the number. Let me know how I can help prepare for you to go. God's not asking you to prepare for them to go. He's asking you to prepare for you to go. Action is required. Thirdly, and finally, I like it, be surrendered completely to the deployment or the calling of the Holy Spirit. You need to be surrendered completely to the calling of the Holy Spirit. We miss opportunities because we're looking for excuses rather than seeking people out. Instead of finding a way to serve God and do what he's asked you to do, you're trying to find a way out of it. I know this has happened to you because you're probably not much different than me, 
but you're checking out in the line at Food City, and all you want to do is get your groceries and get out of there. Selena was there yesterday, and she said, this place is a nut house. So if y'all were there, she was talking about y'all. But, sorry, babe. Um, but this place is crazy. And so we get in there, and we want to just get out of there. But the number of people you're passing. I don't know if some of you are old enough to remember the song, People Need the Lord. People need the Lord. Every day they pass me by, I can see it in their eyes. People need the Lord. You can see it on their face. The desperation that I've given up. COVID has taken us over. We're all going to die. It's so sad. People are desperate for what you have and you're hoarding it. And you're holding it for yourself because it's too difficult to tell somebody about Jesus. Well, I might hurt their feelings. I'd rather hurt their feelings into heaven than let them be unhurt and go to hell. If you're doing everything you can for the work of the Lord and you're confident that this message was not for you, don't even worry about it. We just wasted a little bit of your time. It's not a big deal. Some of you probably sat through timeshare meetings longer than this, so you've wasted time before, right? <laughs> People are laughing like, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> but if this wasn't for you and this had nothing to do with you, you just sit there and don't even worry about it. But if you want to see revival in your church, if you want to see revival in this community, if you want to see this church in such a way that it's never been seen before from this community as a light and a fire for the community, and you realize that you're the one who needs to do something, then you're going to need to come to this altar and make a commitment. Now, you don't have to come to this altar and make a commitment, but I'm telling you right now, if you've ever been to court and you've got nobody to stand behind you, it's not easy. But when you come to this altar, I guarantee you that some, one of your brothers or sisters in Christ is going to come and pray with you. And they're going to say, let me come beside you, and I want to be with you, and we're going to do this together, and let me help you. Don't miss the shoe salesman opportunity that God puts in your path. I'm going to ask the musicians to come as we pray. God, Father, this morning... I've said what you told me to say. I've spoken the words you asked me to speak. And God, it, it, this message may be for me. Maybe I need to work harder on some things, God. And I know that there's always areas that I can grow. There's people that I ought to be talking to more about you, Father, and stop wasting my time and stop wasting the things that I enjoy just for me, God, but to serve you. It can't be about me, Father. It must be about you. God, maybe every person in this building is doing everything they can and God I praise you for that and that is an amazing thought but it's very doubtful that that's possible God because in a crowd this size we have people that could serve you better and do more and I pray that this very morning that they will make that commitment to you God don't let them be afraid don't let Satan hold them back God if someone is here this morning they don't know you as their savior and they want to make that commitment God let today be the day of salvation for them God, I praise you. I give you glory and honor for all that you do. In Jesus' holy name, amen. I'm going to stand up here as we sing. I'd love to pray with you. Everybody will stand. It's easier to come forward when you're standing. That's one of your representatives who's coming up here with me. You're going to have somebody from your church here, somebody you know. Uh, Selena will tell you this is a good thing about me. I can't remember by his name, Ken of June. That's Selena. Uh, so if you come up here and you're embarrassed, you're like, well, that guy don't know me. Guess what? When you leave, I still won't know you. <laughs> but I will pray with you. And I'd love to pray with you. And I'd be honored to pray with you. And I know my brother, Brian. Brian would love to pray with you as well. Right, Jack? Yeah. Okay. Let's sing together, guys.
desperate for Jesus this morning? Are you desperate to be used by Him? I hope that you are. Sing it out, church. Let God know you surrender.
You all may be seated. We just have a few announcements before we close. And first of all, I want to thank Nathan Thomas for being here today. Thank you so much for bringing that word. The thing that I took from that mostly is that, you know, I know I'm saved. And I know I'm going to go to heaven. But am I going to be ashamed when I get to heaven? I don't think any of us want to be ashamed. So we need to be about the Lord's business, telling others about Jesus Christ this week. Uh, In closing, I'm so glad you're here today. And if you're a first-time visitor here, and if you have a welcome home card, please fill that out and drop it off out front. And we have a a gift for you. And we'd love uh, to meet you after the service and say hello to you. And also... Uh, next steps, talking about next steps the most important step is saying yes to Jesus and if you said yes to Jesus or if you rededicated your life or in any way let us know, tell somebody about that and stop by outside and get one of these yes boxes Uh, in the yes box we have a bible and a devotional and some information about taking your next path uh, with Jesus, so stop out there and get that also uh, the most important thing Uh, after that is trying to find a place to serve because if it's not for having community we're not very strong and I thank God for our community here so find a place to be a door holder today and uh, you can also fill out a card and say put me in coach and find a place to serve the Lord in this church Um, and another way that we can give to God is giving back with our finances and we thank you for giving today and starting out the year Uh, If you haven't gave before, let today be the day that you start giving to Jesus so we might be able to do things, not only for what you see in here, but what we do outside these doors and what we do for uh, our community, what we do for international missions and everything like that because 10% of everything you give goes to help others. And lastly, I want to talk about um, our uh, life groups that are starting on January 24th, and I want to invite... Uh, Jerrica up here and let her share a few words about that. Hello again. I just wanted to encourage you all to sign up for our spring small groups. They start on January 24th with a chili cook-off, which I'm really excited about, but we need you all to sign up and bring some chili, and there will be voting and a trophy. I have thought all week about what to say to convince people to come to small groups because small groups mean so much to me, and God just kept saying... You can't convince them. Just plant the seed, pray about it. If they're meant to come, they will come. And I think it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be more flexible this year. We're coming back to church Wednesday nights at 6.30. We are all, the ones at the church are doing sermon questions. There is one group meeting in homes on Sundays. So if Wednesday doesn't work for you and you want to do Sunday after church, we have a group for that as well. Um, Even if you don't want to join a small group, come on Wednesday nights at 6.30 and eat dinner with us. And then we'll do small groups after, and you can go home. That's fine. In this transition time, we just think it's really important for us to all be together. And speaking about transition, I want to give you a quick update about our pastor search. Uh, We are meeting, uh, and we've met a lot. We've reviewed somewhere between 70 and 80 applications. We've watched countless hours of online sermons. And we've done a few Zoom interviews, and we're going to start some personal one-on-one interviews this week, whether pending. Uh, But I want you to know that this church and this body is in the work uh, to try to find the right person that will lead us forward. And I just want you to pray for our pastor search team, pray for our executive team and our advisory team, that we can find the right person to lead us into the, the near future. And again, I want to thank you for coming today. I want to thank Nathan and his lovely wife for being here. And please come back next week. Uh, Brent will be here uh, continuing the sermon on Jonah. And I'm going to pray right now before we leave. Okay. Stop out there and make sure that you get to speak to, to them on the way out also. Dearly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you so much for just blessing us to hear, Lord, your word today, that we might be able to apply to our lives, that we could be stronger in you, that we can go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ to somebody, Lord, today, that we can make a difference to a young man who might be selling shoes or maybe at Food City today working because they need to hear about Jesus too. 
Lord, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. And Lord, I pray that you take everyone safely home today and lead them back here, that we might be able to worship you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good week.